Good afternoon and welcome to the Hargreaves Services PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated in the right corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Gordon Bannum, CEO. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. And look, thank you everyone for taking the time. We're really keen to engage with our retail investors. So hopefully it's a great opportunity for you to hear about how the business is doing. Uh, and I'd always actively encourage you to contact Stephen or myself if there's any questions you have outside of the normal cycle. So our contact details are on our website. So just moving on to the presentation, uh, let me take you through. So first page of the presentation, we talk about the business. Now, remember, those of you who have been with us a long time know that this was a coal business. We created the platform beyond coal. We moved into the delivery stage, very much in the delivery stage. So we're proving the value of these three pillars to everyone. And we're now moving to the realizations factor. Um, the big one we talk about today is renewables, and we'll try and give you some flavor towards that. Um, but what I would say is you have three pillars in here. We have services. It's a very low capital model. Stephen will pick that up. Very inflation resistant. You know, we've had this peak in inflation that everyone's well aware of, yet we've still delivered the profits. So very robust contracts, which do deal with inflation. There's been organic growth there, over 60 uh, framework and term contracts. So, you know, that's a positive protection for us. Land, I always say this to people, remember it is in at cost. So we don't have this exposure to market to market. Um, David will talk about what's happening in the general property portfolio that we own. So remember, we are focused in the North and Scotland. So some of the things you see in the press don't affect us as badly as you might expect if, if we were just a pure residential house builder down in the South, for instance. So David will give you some flavor from that. Um, we're really going to talk about the renewables here as well. I've got a whole slide on that. And then... Um, what I would say is we are moving the land business to a lower capital model. Now, remember, most of our land was our old mining sites. As we're working those through, whether it's Westfields, Blind World, or even Unity, they will release cash, which we will not need, we think, going forward, such a high level of capital employed. We think we can run that business on 10 to 20 million. And again, we'll, Stephen and David will give you some flavor from that. Finally, we talk about Germany, um, and it's a point that people I know do focus on. We do follow the, the uh, shareholder boards. Um, the key point to make you aware of is that uh, we'll talk about the money being there at the moment to support trading. As trading has come off, you'll see that they've repaid our loans. So that was the first stage. Now we're in a point of inflection where if the trading continues to slow down, recessionary pressures in Germany, then we will look to start the repatriation of cash back to the UK at a higher level. Remember, 12p costs about 4 million out of Germany. So if trading starts to slow down, then we will look to repatriate more cash to the UK. The update on that will be at the half year. And the reason for that is we want to see how it develops for the next six months. But we are having ongoing discussions with the German team who are keen if trading volumes drop off or commodities drop off to increase the dividend out. So uh, hopefully we've made it clear. I think people were looking for a time. So we're gonna give you a very firm answer at the half year, a little bit too early to say now, yes, things are looking a bit um, choppy out in Germany, but you know, look, we'll update you at the half year. So just over the page, renewals is the big thing we're talking about. Again, um, here we are, what we're saying to you is look, uh, we've had this independently valued by Jones Lang LaSalle. They've said, if we sell these assets today, you get 21 to 23 million. If we wait till they're all spinning and running, you'll get 27 to 28, 29 million. How long will that take? Um, well, that's the part of that is outside of our control. So what we've said today is maximum five years. We hope that the people get these sites up and running quicker. And then you could see that brought into maybe two to three years from now but we are trying to make sure we're clear and we can definitely deliver. So five years is a slam dunk. Personally, I hope we can get this done sooner, but it is outside of our control. 
So it might be two to three years. Book value is 6.6 .6 million. Uh, we'll generate obviously a quite substantial profit, about 80p a share, and we are committed to passing that back to shareholders. Um, so hopefully that's been clear on time frame. Alongside that, we have other renewable schemes which are less developed. Still about 800 megawatts in capacity. They're beyond the five year time horizon. The good thing about those though, is that they are, in, they are effectively at the book value of the 6.6. .6. So when we sell these, and if we book all the costs to these, they'll virtually be at zero cost. So you'll get the full value of those sales, but they are definitely five years ahead. But again, they'll get updated in the annual jones Lassane valuation. So hopefully that's clear on renewables. Just over the page, just talk about the results. So services, some growth, a uh, big amount came from HS2. We also had some growth in the m and &E and Asia. I cover that later in the presentation. Blind wells, we have a contracted sale on uh, to Avant on 20 acres. David will cover that, but it's in the bag. It's unconditional. So again, David will give you some more details. HRMS, as expected, you know, it shouldn't come as any surprise. The profits of DK are linked to zinc and uh, pig iron prices, and their pig iron prices are linked to iron ore. You've seen them come off. We expected the profits to come off. We told everyone they would. Um, we always like at DK for a high zinc and a high iron ore price. Currently low, therefore the profits have come off. Um, how we see that going forward, I'll pick up later in the presentation. The good thing, remember, is we have a very strong balance sheet. 22 million in cash, so we're not exposed to these high interest rates. So it's a good place to be. And that's why we're able to increase the dividend by nearly 3%. So on that note, I'll hand over to Stephen, our new group finance director, who will chat you through finance numbers. Thanks, thanks Gordon. So first slide here on, on the numbers is just really a, a breakdown of the, of the P&L. So the rev group revenue growing from 178 million to 212. Um, the majority of that growth coming through from the services business, 25% growth nearly. A, a large chunk of that comes from the um, HS2 contract, largely through the earth moving, but it's not entirely due to HS2. Um, some of the growth has come through from winning a new uh, mechanical and electrical engineering contracts, predominantly building of a large conveyor and some silos. But, but also pleasingly, we've seen a lot of growth in our, um, in our, in our Asian uh, business um, which has seen significant growth in, through a contract win, which has been very pleasing to see, actually. So that, what does that translate to in terms of, of profit? So PBT within services has grown from 7.6 million to 12.3 million. Um, included in that 12.3 million is 3.2 million of asset realizations, so one-off gains. Um, those of you who are on the half-year call will have seen that 2 million of that was done in the first half, a further 1.2 in the second half. So obviously that's not really recurrent. Uh, profits, no impact on revenue, obviously, and therefore the, the more underlying PBT is uh, 9.1 million, which is again good growth, 20% you know, growth from 7.6 million. However, the margins actually squeeze down slightly, and that's because the margins that we're experiencing in Asia are, are a bit lower than we do in the UK normally. Uh, PBT from the land business is, is very pleasing actually to see it growing from 2.1 million up to 3.9. Significant growth in that business as some of the, uh, some of the schemes come to fruition. It is somewhat behind uh, where we were hoping it would be, uh, but recent conditions meant that certain sales, particularly at Blind Wells, have been moved into the following year, which David will pick up on shortly. Profit after tax from our German joint venture has reduced from 25 million down to 15 and a half million pounds. So this has been well flagged, I think, in, in a lot of our previous announcements and statements. Uh, and, and the 25 million was never a sustainable level, uh, given the level of commodities, and we'll come on to the detail shortly. Um, but notwithstanding that, 15.5 million remains the second best result that HRMS has ever delivered for the group and is still a very good performance. Corporate costs are in line with, uh, with the prior year, so not a lot to say there. And um, this year, helpfully, amortization, exceptional items and discontinued operations are just amortization of £200,000. The tax rate looks a bit strange because it's 800000 income. And that's because um, the, the group has spent a lot of money uh, on HS2 plant and equipment to fund that contract. And that's meant that we've been able to take advantage of the super deduction, 130% capital allowances, which has sort of flipped the tax charge around the, the opposite way this year. 
The other number I'd really like to pull out on this, uh, this page is the EBITDA. So whilst profit before tax is reduced by about £3 million from the prior year, that's mainly due to, to HRMS, which is non-cash. The actual cash profits of the business have increased significantly. So we've seen a 60% increase in EBITDA, uh, which is really a testament to the amount of growth going on in the underlying services and indeed land business of the group. So moving over the page, we just look at the balance sheet a little bit to give you an idea of where, where the capital is employed across the group. So within services, um, it is a pure coincidence that the capital employed is exactly the same as the previous year, uh, despite the investment into tangible fixed assets. And that's because that investment has been offset by the increase in finance lease debt, which is how we fund all of this plant and equipment. But the, 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 most, the, the most pleasing part about this business is the other working capital, which you'll see is negative. Uh, and this is a demonstration of our tight working capital regime and the ability to be paid before we have to pay others. Uh, and that's been the case in the services business for a long time. Uh, within land, um, Gordon did mention the capital light model. It doesn't appear that way at the moment. That's where we're hoping to get to. Uh, the 16.5 million of tangible fixed assets includes 6.6 .6 million of renewables, which obviously we uh, talked about in the first slide and, and David will pick up on it again. Uh, we have another uh, large development at Westfield, upon which uh, third party is building an EFW and some infrastructure spend has gone into that. So that's 5.2 million. And then there's some other bits and pieces around the group which aren't too important for pulling out right now. Uh, the other large number on here is 39 million of inventory, of which 35 is the Blindwell site. And there's also a sizable debtor within other working capital relating to Blindwells. So this is just really to give you an idea of the size of uh, the balance sheet relating to land and how much is taken up by the Blind Wells site. Uh, if you could imagine, I know it's difficult, but if you can imagine taking the Blind Wells number out uh, and following the sale of the renewables assets, actually that 73 million invested in land really comes down to a number much closer to 20 or something like that, uh, which is sort of the model I think David wants to, to, uh, to adopt going forward. Uh, in terms of HRMS, those two numbers come coming to 80 million, I'll pick them up in a couple of slides time if, if that's okay. And on, on unallocated, um, the two numbers I'm going to talk about are pension scheme and deferred tax asset. The tax asset of 11 million is increased from nine. This is just built up losses within the group and it's increased in the air because of the impact of the super deduction, which yes, we got the deduction, but we weren't able to utilize it also it'll roll into future years. And then the pension scheme number. So 5.6 million assets on the balance sheet. Uh, this doesn't make any sense because we pay two million pounds a year to service the deficit. But this is just the way the accounting treatment uh, operates at this present time. So the key thing, key news on the pension scheme is the intention of the board to now buy out this scheme and, try, and to avoid having to pay this two million pound a year deficit reduction contributions. So we currently estimate, given the way gilt yields are, where asset values are within this scheme, it'll cost around about £15 million to buy the scheme out. That £15 million buyout will liberate £2 million a year from free cash flow. And it's the intention of the board to use that additional £2 million to effectively bolster the dividend going forward, most likely from FY25 onwards, depending on the timing of when the pension scheme is able to be bought out. Just looking at the cash flow now, um, we started the year with £14 million just under in the bank and made profit of 27. However, a large chunk of that was from the joint venture, and that's not cash until such time as they pay us a dividend, so that comes out. But equally, depreciation and amortisation is not cash, so that comes back in. Profit on disposal and then net capex is um, a, fun a function of selling off plant and equipment. So the net capex of £2.4 million uh, includes just over 5 million spent on the Westfield development. So that's enabling the site to be able, for the third party, to be able to build the uh, EFW plant that's currently going up now. And that's been offset by the capital receipts from the one-off gains we've had, uh, which I mentioned two slides ago. The significant increase in, um, in leasing debt has obviously meant we need to pay lease payments. And so 13 million pounds has been what we've paid on that this year. I suspect that should grow slightly next year as we uh, have full years of these, these assets which are bought in the air. The only really unusual item on this uh, tab is the 50 million loan to HRMS, which is a cash receipt. And the equivalent chart last year showed a 50 million cash outflow to HRMS. So this is where we lent the joint venture 50 million pounds for them to be able to take advantage of the trading opportunities that were there at the time. They've done so, 
The commodity prices have come away, that's liberated some cash, they've been able to repay the 15 million pounds. Otherwise, the working capital is pretty flat. Um, the, other two, the other few columns are pension contributions, which are slightly higher than the 2 million I mentioned, and that's because we had an additional one-off payment in the year. And dividends paid of 6.7, which is made up of 4 million, um, our additional dividend, the 12 pence that we've paid for a few years now relating to Germany, and 2.7 million underlying dividend. We also made a small acquisition at the start of the year for 1.7 million within the services business. So we have a slide now on HRMS, and that's important because if you look at the accounts, there's only really two numbers, and that's not really going to give anyone a picture of what's going on. So um, in the top left corner, we've got a brief P&L, and um, the three, three strands of the business, which Gordon will touch on what they actually do shortly. Um, you'll see that the trading business, the traditional trading business revenues dropped quite dramatically. That is partly due to volume reduction and partly because commodity prices have come off. So that those two have a bit of a double rally on the, on the revenue. We've also seen a reduction in DK. That's mainly commodity driven. Uh, volumes are broadly the same. So the, the reduction isn't quite as marked. That reduction therefore falls through effectively through to the bottom line. There's also been a squeeze on the margin. But notwithstanding that, as I mentioned earlier, our share of the profit of 15 and a half million pounds is still a very good return from this business. Um, and certainly better than we've seen in the past with the exception of the prior year. So one question we're getting quite regularly is like, this business has been doing extremely well for, for quite a few years now. So where is all the money? Where, where is that? So I'm hoping to answer that on the balance sheet tab, which is on the bottom right. So the biggest number on there is the inventories, 136 million pounds worth of inventory tied up. That's where a lot of the profit has gone. They've reinvested the profit into the business to buy inventories to be able to take advantage of the market opportunities that are there. If we look at the prior year inventory, it's come down from 147 to 136. It's that reduction that has meant that they can repay the short term 50 million pound loan. So that's come back into the group this year. The other big moving part in the balance sheet is the fixed assets. So the recycling plant at DK has needed some effectively upgrades doing to it in the year and the profit that they've made in the year, they've reinvested into that capital, capital projects there. So what does that mean for our exposure? Well, that's, that's the bottom left corner here. So our share of retained earnings of 68.6 million is the profit that HRMS has built up over the last four to five years, but not repatriated to the business because it's reinvested it in the business. Uh, the total loans of 11.2 million is effectively quasi equity. This money was put in uh, ooh, over 10 years ago now as effectively as collateral for the German business to get their borrowing base, their local funding in place. Uh, and that will not come back until such time as the borrowing base is no longer there. Uh, you'll also notice that the guarantee has increased in the air. This was a way to um, get local funders to increase the borrowing base for Germany without us having to put additional funds in. Um, we don't see at the moment any reason to be putting any further funds into HRMS. In fact, then Gordon will pick up on it. Quite the opposite is hopefully true. So I'll pass over to Gordon now. Thanks. Thanks for that, Stephen. So just the operating review. So remember, shareholders own a services business of the three pillars. Um, as I said before, blue chip customers, you can see they're there. Um, we're in a strong position because already at the start of the year, 70% of the revenue is already in the bag. And we have a lot of framework contracts, which means that it gets topped up automatically. So we're sitting on a solid position plus 60 framework contracts, typical operating margins of 5%. So basically at the start of the year, it's in the bag. And I think we've proved with inflation that uh, we can weather that very well over the last year. So not worried about that. Um, also the industry sectors we're in, we're not exposed to retail. So it's energy is okay, environmental is okay, UK infrastructure, obviously HS2 and industrial sectors. So we're in good spaces at the moment uh, and good performance. Where did the growth come? which is be the next slide, which people always ask. Um, on the next slide, we talk about the growth. So that is, uh, sorry, thank you, Stephen. Um, so there's been a growth of about 38 million. Big part of that was uh, HS2, but then we had some M&E wins, as you can see. And we also had some growth in Asia, which we were happy to see. Um, I think our investment in Asia has now reached a tipping point where we hope to see it as a, 
larger part of the business and hopefully we'll see that in the next couple of years. Um, so just over the page. So what's the opportunities for growth? Well, let's just take those on board. We have over two, 10 new framework contracts that have been added in the year that's just finished. Some of them like port of time biomass do not start till October. So these 10 new contracts will start to feed in and deliver some of the organic growth in services plus new contract wins that we hope to get. So there's the growth organically. Um, Tungsten West is worth a discussion for shareholders. Those who track it will know it's a listed vehicle. They will know that it raised six million pounds uh, effectively, and that money uh, sees them through to December. Now we are in detailed discussions with the board of Tungsten West, um, and they are hoping to raise a further, I think it's in the region of 50 million. If they get that 50 million, uh, under the terms of the agreement, they will pay our shareholders back the 5 million that's secured against the asset. This is the million a year royalty. So they will repay that 5 million. So we'll get a 5 million inflow. Also, we will start the mining services contract, which is open book, cost plus 7.5%. So work on plus 20 million of sales, 7.5%, 1.5 million. So you get 1.5 million of annualized profit on the long-term contract, you get the 5 million of cash, and you do not get a credit exposure because the terms of the contract, which were negotiated when we sold the site to Tungsten West, are that we get paid in advance. So shareholders have no credit exposure because people would be worried with the history of Tungsten West about what happens if it gets into a muddle. I don't think it will. It has a very strong management team now, but I'm just saying you are protected just to reassure you. Just moving on to the major infrastructure projects, we are now preferred partner with Balfa Beatty on the Lower Thames Crossing, and we have done two contracts at Sizewell. One has uh, already completed, and that was for a subcontract, but the second one is direct for Sizewell. So we're hopeful, especially as those of you who know our uh, offices uh, in Essex, close to Sizewell, um, the localism agenda should work well for us. Um, and it's worked well for us in Lower Thames. So we, we see earthworks going. HS2 has another couple of years to run. We then move on to Lower Thames, then to Sizewell. So you can see this pipeline going out quite a way. Um, and we are also tendering on several mechanical and engineering projects, which again would flow into services. So the outlook, I believe, is quite good for the services group. David will now take you through land and I'll ultimately take you through Germany. Okay, thanks, Gordon. So, um, just change to slide 16 then, um, just to explain what Harvey's Land does. Uh, we operate in four sectors. So, we have the master, what we call the master developer role. Uh, this is one where we are the, the lead developer on a number of large scale sites that are multi phase, uh, typically have at least a decade of life in them. Um, we own two of them outright, the other two are held under options, which we can draw down sort of as required. Uh, typically, we will basically put in infrastructure against forward sale commitments and then sell service plots to house builders and with commercial sites uh, will either sell the plots through to end users or and take the direct development of the schemes themselves. Um, the second area we have is the turnkey uh, project delivery. These are uh, bespoke schemes. Uh, we operate primarily in the retail warehousing and logistics space markets. So, uh, retail housing is normally pre-let to retailers and forward sold. Uh, logistics space, again, is typically pre-let or at least forward sold to investors. Uh, and these are one-off projects that take several years to set up and then get delivered within a 12-month window. Um, the third area is the planning for motion agreement um, side, which is really strategic planning. So this is where we um, identify normally greenfield sites, uh, which have the potential to secure planning sent on through the local plan process. Uh, we secure these by ways of options or conditional contracts or promotion agreements. And then we promote them through the plan process. Uh, that's normally anywhere between a five and a 10 year period. It can be very variable from two or three years uh, to 10 years plus. And uh, really at the end of it, the agreements provide that we recover our costs together with the margin um, as a percentage of the sale price. And at the moment, we've got just under two and a half thousand residential plots uh, spreading out across uh, just over 200 acres. 
um, under contract to promote, be promoted. And finally, as Gordon mentioned, we've got the renewables. Um, these are, uh, this is land that we own. Uh, just to be clear, we're not the developer of the renewable assets. We have facilitated securing the grid connections and the planning consent. And uh, then we have contracts with third party renewables providers who are actually doing the direct development. So we, we have no capex spend on this at all. Um, but we end up getting a, a revenue stream for each of those assets. Uh, normally at least 28 years duration leads to the, um, the actual, either the, the energy value of the energy being generated or fixed numbers linked to CPI. Um, at the moment, we've got nine projects that are progressing through where we have certainty on the commercial values of these, which is why we've had Jones Lang uh, LaSalle value them. Um, the reality being is until they get quite advanced, it's difficult to predict the time scales and the actual overall revenue generation. But we're on those projects, we've now got to a stage where these can be reasonably accurately predicted, uh, hence why we've done have the valuation done externally. Turning to the key events for FY23, uh, just as a backdrop um, into the general market conditions, Q1 of that year, we had very strong market conditions, both the commercial and residential sectors. If anything, I would have said it was actually very frothy, particularly noticeable in terms of the activity in the residential sector by house builders and the sort of values they were throwing about. Um, and also on the um, investment market from the commercial space, particularly uh, extremely buoyant, very keen yields being uh, sort of provided, underpinned by um, investors looking to gain greater exposure to that market. Um, Q2 and 3, uh, rapidly deteriorating conditions for reasons we all know about. Um, the result was that um, the market effectively stopped. Uh, people weren't willing to buy into a falling market, so very little was done. And then finally, in Q4, um, the market conditions have begun to stabilise at that point. Uh, they definitely will not be described as having stabilised, but definitely beginning to stabilise uh, with a bit more activity beginning in the market as people start to rebuild confidence. Um, so with that in mind, that uh, during the year, we had a number of, sort of key transactions, uh, an event. Uh, first one really was Westfield, where we completed the infrastructure for the phase one development, which was servicing the um, EFW scheme, uh, which we're not building, I listen to add, um, and for the 40 acres of employment land adjacent, which will benefit from low cost heat and power uh, thrown off at the EFW. Um, secondly, we completed the Bridlington Retail Warehouse scheme, which had been delayed due to the contractor. Uh, going bust, so we had to sort that out, but we weren't didn't have financial exposure because we were cut off by insurance. Um, we sold our 50% share in an auction house investment at Maltby. Um, the opportunity came up, it was a good way of um, sort of bringing that cash in early. And then at Blind Rolls, we had 77 plots completed, um, and we exchanged them conditionally for the 342 plots. Ideally, that would have happened last financial year. But given the turmoil in the market, that got delayed. But the key thing there is that the exchange is unconditional and it will complete in January 24 in this financial year. And then we now have the 140 plots that are now subject to agreed sales terms and are now applying their way through legals. Um, so potentially that's going to add a further upside to the year. Um, in Sunderland, this was one of these bespoke schemes, which is a retail warehouse scheme. We Ford sold it to Home Bargains. Um, as it turned out, we secured the planning set in relatively quick order. Um, home bargains sought to basically do the direct development sales. And we were quite happy with that because at the time, construction costs were very uncertain given the inflation rate. So we simply sold the site on and took our margin that way with sort of effectively zero ongoing risk. And then finally, at Unity Doncaster, as part of a large mixed use scheme, um, we're well on site now with the construction of Ford Soul Logistics Unit, just under a couple of thousand square feet. Uh, that's currently slightly ahead of programme, it's due to complete in November uh, this year. Turning over the page then, in terms of the um, looking forward to development pipeline, the development pipeline is important uh, from hardware and land point of view, simply because of the fact that, as you'll probably appreciate, land takes quite a long time to bring through to delivery, and therefore we need to have a constant topping the pipeline uh, to keep that momentum going. So at the moment, we have uh, just under 6,000 residential plots across 800 acres, six sites, um, which are consented or allocated, and have a GDV. That's essentially the service site value of circa 200 million. 
And then we've got a further uh, 2,800 residential plots um, across another seven sites, uh, which adds up to about 300 acres, where, which we have under contract, so we own, and we're promoting through the various local plan processes, which um, if they all secure planning, would have a service plot value of around about 120 million. So again, it gives you a clear view of the pipeline uh, going forward. And then on the commercial side, uh, we've now got about 5.7 million square feet of allocated or consented commercial space across six sites, which gives us a lot of visibility on uh, really commercial schemes going forward in the long term, as a GDV of the built space of around just over 600 million pounds. So in terms of the outlook then, um, what we've seen generally in the market is the residential markets, um, demand for quality sites has, has certainly continued to stabilise. Um, it is at lower levels than we saw in Q1 2022, but to be honest, uh, that point was very frothy, probably unsustainable in any event, and we certainly hadn't budgeted at that level, uh, so it hasn't had a particular impact on us. Uh, we're certainly seeing a decent amount of um, interest from house builders and offers being made, um, albeit the range of pricing that comes forward is, is much more variable than it perhaps was previously. Um, on the commercial market, um, commercial occupier market remains reasonably active. They're not quite been pushed to act as quickly as they were before, but still demand is out there from, from the occupier side. Uh, we've seen a significant softening of investment yields for the investment side, and that's taken a lot of the speculative development out of the market. Um, but what we have also seen is the fact that uh, rents and capital values have increased uh, for only occupiers and tenants because it's the only way they can actually get their, their buildings financed, and that hasn't been particularly an issue. Um, there continues to be a, a decent demand for a new unit, particularly the smaller end of the scale, um, where there's never been a significant build out of speculative space, so that, that helps our portfolio. And then finally, on the renewables projects, um, we've got a very extensive range of these projects now moving forward. We've got the first batch, which we talked about earlier, where we're expecting to start talking about taking those to market. Um, in the next year or so, uh, it will take a few years to sell those through out, uh, and that time scale that is largely when they reach a stage where the value is optimised, which is typically where they are actually turning and generating revenue, and that revenue visibility is optimised. Uh, and then we have a further tranche of additional renewable opportunities, similar ones, wind farms, battery storage, uh, together with one or two more exotic ones, such as high nitrogen farms, where we are working our way through the planning process, agreements with op operators, uh, and we expect those to come on stream in the next five years. So you're looking at sort of follow-on sale of packages probably towards the end of the five years for those. But again, it's, it's something which we're, we're pleased that we've seen that being built on. Right, Terry, you go over. Thanks, David. <laughs> so Germany's, you know, a big part of the group. So just to recap, remember that we have 49.9% of the voting rights but we get 86% of the economic interest. Business was always a trading business. Uh, talk about it in a bit of detail, but what we've added to it is these assets, coal pulverization plant and DK recycling. They all trade around each other. The advantage trading now has that it sells probably 260,000 tons of additional product that goes into the pulverization plant or DK recycling. So all three units work very well together. Talking about the detail, though, in each business. So remember, trading, in some res respects, regarded as low-quality earnings because it's volatile. But having said that, they have never made a loss. It's fact about trading. Um, they've done very well over the years. But look how it spiked up. Well, two sides to why it spiked up. One, commodity prices moved up, so they were able to benefit from commodity prices. But it was also that additional volume that's come a function from owning DK and the grinding plant. So you can see high levels, it will drop away as commodities normalize and maybe trading activity slows down a bit in Europe, but it won't drop to the levels previously because it has this inbuilt additional volume of over a quarter of a million tons. So just take you over the page. This is very interesting. This is the coal pulverization plant. So what does it do? It pulverizes steam coal, that then can be used in cement plants and steel plants. Now, the investment was nearly 30 million in this. Um, at the moment, it's doing 100,000 tons a year and break even. So you'd look at that and say, why isn't it doing 400,000? Reason is because Germany closed its nukes. And then when the gas problem with the invasion of Ukraine hit, they were 
loath to close their lignum brown coal mines. So they're still producing. When they close, the cement plants who are moving towards carbon capture will need a new source of raw material. And this is perfect. So a lot of cement plants have trialed this pulverized coal, happy to use it. Um, and because they're getting it down the carbon capture technology route, they will still consume coal. So in my view, this is poised, ready to go. Ukraine has caused a delay of profit for shareholders, I have to admit that, but it's ready to go. And hopefully in the next few years, as the lignum brown coal mines close, this will open up. So just over the page, DK recycling. Remember the business model is that we get dusts from steel plants around Europe. We get paid a gate fee for taking them. We then process it through our own unique process. It's the only one in the world and it produces pig iron and zinc. The zinc um, is typically sold um, at 50% we hedge, 50% is open. Now, as you look at this graph, you'll see that the numbers peaked and they've now come off. Um, and that obviously comes straight off the bottom line, which again shows why the profits have dropped from where they were. The other side is pig iron. Our competitors obviously buy, buy iron ore. So when prices of iron ore are high, um, then it's great for us because we are only pay, we're getting a gate fee for our input, but it's fixed. So now I know our prices are coming off, that obviously suppresses the profit in DK. So really high zinc, high pig iron prices are good for DK, low pig iron and zinc prices are not so good. But what we show in the graph on the left is the fact that one of our biggest inputs is coke, which uh, reduces the uh, iron ore to um, liquid iron, and that tracks iron ore prices. So the cost of one of our major input raw materials is dropping, which is helping to compensate for the pig iron drop, uh, but obviously not compensating for all of it, but gives us a degree of protection. So just over the page, we talk about ESG. ESG is really important to us because of the type of customer deal with, and it's morally right. Um, we have got CSR, gold accreditation, we're Integrum A rating, that's very important for winning new contracts with the type of customers we deal with. It is embedded into the business. It's an important part of what we do. So just over the page. So really the summary and outlook. So services, I hope you've seen, it's all targeted on organic growth. It's very cash generative. It's very cash light, as Stephen demonstrated. Um, we've proved the inflation protection. The growth is there. You've got lower terms, size well, the m and &E growth, so fine, really solid, looking forward to the next 12 months there. Land, yes, we've got this renewables, which is going to be maybe ATP a share. Remember, we're making it very clear that as soon as it is, is sold, we will return the money to shareholders. Underneath that sits a property business. We developed out our own property assets that we owned that were at cost. Remember, they're held at the books at cost. Don't think that was wrong. That was the right thing to do. As we've harvested that profit, you will see the cash invested in the property side of the business drop to the lower version. So from where it is typically in the 10 to 20 million is all we'll have invested. So you can see a whole layer of cash being returned um, as these big sites get sold out and turned in, into capital. And again, um, we are in the north and Scotland. So we think that we have some natural protection from the downturn. We're not all residential in the South, for instance. HRMS, very interesting dynamic there. Um, hopefully you've seen from Stephen's slide that they've been able to repay the debt thanks to the profits they've had, the money they owed us, so the loans have come back. Now, detailed discussions are going on with the German management team to talk about if the trading is not there and the commodity prices aren't so high, it's an ideal opportunity to repatriate cash to the UK and to them as shareholders. Um, and we will update the market very clearly in January about what's going to happen. So they'll either be really good profits because they've got really good opportunities, or we'll be sitting down and telling shareholders we're going to increase the dividend. Interestingly, the 12p is fixed and that's fine and secure, but it only costs about 4 million to give you 12p. So the opportunity to increase that dividend significantly is there. So I think when you look at the group, both land and services are in a very good place. 
Um, HS2 getting up to full speed. Blind Rolls is already in the bag for David and his team. Pension buyout, uh, it's a really good moment in time to take it out where the market is at the moment. We're moving as fast as we can to get that done. Once it's done, the two million we paid out to the pension trustees, we will then look to increase the dividend by two million when it's all done and dusted and out of the way. Um, again, the benefit of sitting on this cash means we're not exposed to inflation and we're not moving into the borrowing levels either. So let's be clear. Um, we won't have an exposure to interest rates. So a uh, good opportunity. The group's in a very good position. Just to close, um, hopefully you're all reassured. We have a very grown up board. Remember, I'm an 8% shareholder, so I'm very much aligned with yourselves. Roger McDowell, well known to many people on AIM, quality chairman. And Christopher Mills um, at Harwood is represented by son Nick on the board. So we have a really strong board, really strong balance sheet. There's some visibility, which I hope we've made very clear for you today. What I would encourage retail investors is um, we, we look at some of the message boards. Uh, please just ring us and ask us and we'll tell you so you don't need to speculate. We'll tell you what's going on in the business um, so that there's no misunderstandings. Um, you can see our discount to NAV and our job as a management team is to communicate very clearly to everyone to narrow that gap for the benefit of all our shareholders. So on that note, uh, I'd like to close and open up to questions. So perfect. Gordon, David, Stephen, thank you very much for your presentation. What I'll do now is I'll just bring your camera up to full screen. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated on the top right corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed by your investor dashboard. As you can see, we've received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. And Stephen, if I could just hand over to you just to chair the q and I'll pick up from you at the end. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Um, so we've had quite a few. We'll see how many we get through. We'll try and get through them all. Um, the first question is a pre-submitted one. Um, I think this has been answered, but Gordon, if you could just, how optimistic are you about the outlook going forward and why? Yeah, uh, let me put it another way. You can see very, uh, very positive on the outlook for services. I hope I've demonstrated that. Land, David's in a good position, confident with his numbers. Blindwell's already in the bag. You know land, it's, it's big transactions. I think we've been cautious this year. He could put another couple in, in the back of the net uh, if some deal's clear, so positive with that. Germany, of course, is an area that, that we look at um, because of recession in Germany. Everyone can see that in the press. But again, if things close down, the trading team do not take risks. So they will back out of the trading environment, which will liberate a lot of cash. So I think even if there's a downturn in Germany, that will improve the repatriation of cash much quicker to the UK. Thank you. Uh, next one is, uh, what would be the effect on the company if HS2 was cancelled? So remember, our piece of HS2 will not be cancelled. We're talking about a big slice of Buckingham that's already, Buckinghamshire that's already been ripped up. Um, that bit's going to happen. There's no plans to cancel that. What they're talking about is reducing where they come in at, um, to Euston and also maybe not going beyond Birmingham. None of the stuff beyond Birmingham was in our forecasts. So simple answer is the bit that we do will not be cancelled in the next two years. And the point is that we didn't have further pieces forecast because they're not going to, they've spent so many billions, they're going to finish this bit, is my view. And um, how, how much reluctance is there from the 51% voting shareholder in HSCL to pay out a dividend? None at all. They are a management team who are well aligned with ourselves. They've just uh, seen the opportunity to make a lot of profits that have kept the cash in the business. They believe in the business, but they like us are saying, we don't need it to sit in the bank doing nothing. Let's take it out if, if, it's, if it's not needed. So first, first of the questions that were submitted from Mark C, um, how long will the HS2 business continue at its current level? About a couple of years. This year, one more, and then it will start to tail away, which is fortunately for us is when Lower Thames picks up. Uh, I think this one's for you, David, from Alan C. Uh, regarding the other land in the business, so um, you know, he's thanking us for the renewables valuation by uh, Jones Lang LaSalle. A lot of other land in the business. Um, could we have that valued and, and what so we can see what that might be worth? 
Yeah, we've 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 looked at this. Um, I'm not a big fan of value and development land. Uh, the reality being is that a huge number of assumptions need to be made um, to actually do a develop to a valuation on that, and as a result, really the the valuation is is questionable. I think because the assumptions have to all fall to, to be right. So really, the reason why we did the renewables was the fact we had some very clear um, income. Um, expectations which were based in reality and therefore we could actually be quite accurate with the valuation you can't put the market conditions uh, you can't say that when you're developing bare land um, because you know when is it going to be sold how much is going to take to develop out what's the rate of development what's the cost of the infrastructure etc too many variables to do give you anything that, which would otherwise be misleading but i think to reassure you they are held at cost yes so that should give you confidence because that builds into our NAV, which is a, a big discount to, to our share price at the moment. Picked up on some questions that might be coming. Oh, right. Uh, okay. Not this one, though, from Mark B. So um, if trading increases at HRMS, will we need to provide a further capital loan or can they fund it themselves with an RCF or something? Similar? And, and the answer is that we will not be putting any more money across to Germany. They can fund themselves. Yeah. Another one from the same mark. So regarding Tungsten West, they mentioned that there were issues with low frequency noise mm -hmm. that needs to be resolved to gain environmental approval. Have you got any comments on that? Yeah, so we, we as I said, you can imagine as the main mining contractor, we're in detailed discussions with them. Um, they've submitted the uh, to the EA um, and they think they'll get the answer um, in the next 12 to 16 weeks. Once they get it, they'll go out with their fundraise. Um, you know, Will they get it or not? I can't comment because I'm not an expert in that field, but that's their plan. And they seem a very confident management team that are there now. Um, thank you. So the next question is from Kevin C. Uh, you seem to have some activities growing and some contracting. Uh, what do you see the business looking like in a few years time? <laughs> uh, it's a very good question. We, we talk internally here um, that we see a situation where look at land, capital light, having 10 to 20 million in, a services business um, that continues to grow organically, um, and you can look at the numbers yourself there. Uh, and then Germany is the, the question that, that I haven't got an answer for you today. Um, it doesn't naturally sit as part of the group. Uh, there's a lot of money tied up there. I think it's the, the update that we will give you hopefully in 12 months time about where we see the long-term future of Germany. Uh, another one from, from Alan. Uh, the three businesses are distinct from one another and as some of the parts valuation would suggest a company is worth between seven to eight pounds a share how do you how do you hope to close the gap well i think one of the things that we're doing now is, is trying to communicate our job is to try and communicate clearly um so that people can see the value there that's what this is about what the roadshow is about um i mean the markets as everybody knows are very difficult out there um share prices are very depressed We've all had that um, hit us in our pensions or whatever. Our job is to keep talking and doing a good job. The market should eventually see the value in the company. Uh, this one's for David from Brandon. Uh, what's the estimated construction cost to realise the 620 million GDV on the commercial pipeline? Uh, normally you'd be talking round about, um, I would have said that's probably getting off about 500 million pounds of construction costs, but we it would be something that we would fund. Uh, those projects will be forward sold, so effectively the, the ultimate buyer will fund that construction cost um, as it is incurred, uh, as we've done on the, the first 191,000 square foot logistics unit, where we sold the site through and then the funder has funded the construction cost. So our exposure is, is very light and it's fully recovered when the deal happens. And uh, another question from Brandon, again for you, David. When, when do we think the first renewable disposal will take place? Um, we're targeting uh, next financial year. Uh, we think there'll be enough of a package by then to take to the market. Um, we're not entirely in control of all of the events, uh, but we think there'll be enough there to make it worthwhile taking to the market next financial year. And then I think one for you, Gordon. Ro Rohit has asked questions. I think it's similar to one that we've had before, but... Um, with Hargreaves looking like moving towards an asset line, line model, what will the business look like in five years' time? Will it end up just being a services business? I think, I think a, a, a land services business where it's capital light, where, so not the one that we have heavy capital in, in it. So land will still be part of the group and a services business. Yeah, that's what we see um, the business turning into over a period of time. Um, 
Um, has the current level of trade with HRMS already reduced to facilitate cash repatriation to the UK at this stage? Uh, say that again, Stephen. Has the current level of trading within HRMS reduced to facilitate cash repatriation to the UK? Oh, so could they pay could money they do to it now? Could they, yes, I think they could do. Um, that's, uh, and the answer is that at the moment they're in discussions with a couple of uh, potential suppliers to take on uh, an agency deal for product, which could have significant volume. And they've said, look, let's hang on, see if we can win those and the profits that go with them. If they don't win those agency contracts, then I think the cash is coming back, but we just need to see how those happen. The next question is from, from Richard. It's quite a long, quite a long one, but the, the point is, given the extremely large discounts in NAV, is the board concerned about a low ball takeover approach? And to what extent would institutional shareholders support or reject an offer? I think you should be comfortable that um, Harvard, and they've got a track record of, of, of not selling at the bottom. Um, so I'm very comfortable. You've got 8% sitting with me, uh, you've got Harwood sitting there with nearly 29%, um, and we have a lot of respect for that team. So everything's for sale if the price is right, but a low ball I don't think would get very far. And um, another question from Rohit, how will cash be returned to shareholders? Special dividend, buyback? Well, that's a very good question, and, and again, we've been asked that on the roadshow, and, and the answer is, you know, if the... if we were sitting with a lot of this execution having taken place. Um, and one of the things I do say to people is, look, this was a complicated model over in time. It's getting much more simple. I think everyone should, by the end of this presentation, see there's a clear route to value. It's all about will we execute successfully over the next couple of years for you. If you believe we will, you should see the share price correcting. If the share price doesn't correct, then share buybacks make a lot of sense because we are very convinced of the sum of the parts valuation for the business. So if share prices stayed where they were, it would be share buybacks. Of course, if the share price rises to a level which is appropriate, then we would go to the dividend route. Great. Uh, next question is from Ian, which I think I'll, I'll cover regarding um, some confusion between the, the cash flow and the fact that we've had, a, looks like we paid back £9 million worth of debt on the balance sheet, but actually liabilities have gone up. Um, Ian, you've said in there, are they excluded from the cash flow, hence the mis mismatch? You're absolutely correct. The cash flow that we that I went through before was purely cash. So whilst during the year we've paid back some of the leasing debt, we've paid the lease providers, during the year we've also brought in a lot more leasing debt. So the net debt or the leasing debt has increased and we've paid off some of that using cash. Uh, we tend to just run through cash um, because leasing debt is linked to the assets specifically and, and isn't quite as meaningful as thinking about an RCF or some other sort of revolving debt. Uh, next question, I think is for David. What, what is the value to Hargreaves of the 670 million GDV? Uh, our normal rule of thumb is that we would target 15% um, profit on GDV, uh, net of cost. So that gives you a rough target as to where our expectations will be on that. And then um, Robert's got another question regarding what's a top, do we have a target EPS for three to five years time? Or should we look to use maybe ordinary dividend per share as a guide for valuation? I think you, you, we, we cannot give forecasts. So I think the, you have to look at the singer's note or the, yeah. for, for answers to that. Yeah. Um, Philip's question, how is the latest position on the DB pension scheme contribution situation? I think the, the point here, Philip, is we're currently paying off um, paying contribution, deficit contribution repayments of just under £2 million a year. Um, we've just gone through the triennial valuation in which we agreed we'd have to pay that for certainly the next three years at least. Beyond that time, we'd hope that the gap had closed. But unless we buy it out, the gap can always remain and markets can always move against us and trustees can be very cautious, uh, wanting more and more money from the employer. So... Um, that's why we're looking at right now, stars have aligned somewhat to try and take this out. Um, whilst we have the surplus cash, we're not harming the other aspects of the business. And that will then release the cash to be able to hopefully push the dividend up in a couple of years' time. And the final question from Rohit, uh, rather than repatriate earnings from HRMS, is there any interest from the JV partner or third part or a third partner in buying our stake out? Uh, uh, and the answer is um, we haven't opened that dialogue yet, so not at the moment, but there may be.
And that is the final question. Thank you Perfect. very much. Gordon, David, Stephen, thank you very much for that. I think you actually managed to address every single question from investors. And of course, the company will review all questions submitted today and will publish those responses on the Investor Meet Company platform. But just before redirecting investors, provide you with their feedback, which is particularly important to the company. Gordon, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Well, the first thing, if you don't mind me, is closing to say, just so uh, shareholders know, this is not our office. This is our <laughs> broker. So the pictures in the background are nothing to do with us. Um, you know, it's not what we're used to, but, you know, we do have to have a broker, so therefore we're using their offices. Uh, look, it's really important to us retail shareholders uh, know what we're doing. Please, I actively encourage you, if there's any issues that anyone wants to ask, you're equally important to us as the big shareholders down here. Um, so please contact us and we'll feed back anything to help educate, because our job I think it was picked up in one of the questions is to narrow the gap um, on the share price. And that's only going to be done by clear communication. So if we've done things wrong or haven't made it clear, uh, I'm not too proud to, to get criticism and try and improve it next time around for you. So look, thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest, everyone. Have a good evening. Perfect. Gordon, David, Stephen, thank you once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, so I'm sure it will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Hargreaves Services PLC, I'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.